Emmy left the room to go and get some bleach or some more cleaning um, detergents. And when she came back, she noticed that Zara was spraying the air freshener in the room. And Zara exclaimed so loudly that you stink. Now, a moment of silence because we all know that African armpit smell can really get overwhelming. We know that. We know. <laughs> so I'm assuming our poor Emily was suffering from that African armpit smell. Okay? Listen, this is a girl who came from a place where she did not know where her next meal was coming from. So buying deodorant was the last thing on her mind. But it's okay. Rich kids are mean. It's okay. And like I said, perhaps Emily really genuinely suffered from that African armpit smell. It, it, it can get a lot. It can get overwhelming. It's, it's like pungent. Hi everyone. Happy New Year. Wishing everyone watching this video a blessed and prosperous 2023. Um, I'm hoping all your dreams, intentions and goals are achieved throughout this year and just an overall exciting year there's something amazing about starting a new year so wishing you the best for this year i'm excited to share the book uh, or the video essay the book essay book review <laughs> for today and that is um called we're getting straight into it it's called even when your voice shakes by ruby yera goka every time i look down it's because i have all my notes right in front of me a little bit of a um Fun fact about the author, she is a Ghanaian writer and dentist. And for some reason, I am drawn to Ghanaian writers at this specific point in time. I don't know why, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the pull that they have on me. And oh man, I can't wait to one day just visit Ghana. Because every time I read about the places and things that they reference in the book, I'm like, man, I'd love to see this. So... Just a little fun fact about it. And of course, the book we're going to review today has a um, lot of referencing about Ghana, um, the lifestyle, the people, the country, the food, you know, all about this. So it's, for me, I, I enjoyed that very, very much. So let's get straight into the book. All right, we meet our protagonist, Na Emily. Um, Na is spelled N-A-A, -A, so I'm pretty convinced I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's probably na -a or Na or you drag the A, who knows? But we meet our protagonist and <laughs> already there's so much societal challenges just at the first meeting okay she is um the first born daughter of her parents and at this point in the beginning of the book she has about three siblings i'm still not sure the number of siblings she has in the beginning but um i i'm thinking she has three siblings the reason why i'm not sure because it is mentioned in the book that her mom had recently or, or, or it's not necessarily recently but what is mentioned is that her mom had given birth to the last born daughter and her father was extremely disappointed now you see she's the first daughter okay she has other siblings who are also girls and the mom gave birth to another girl so gender disappointment is an actual real thing in african communities um here is this african ghanaian man with a wife who only produces females um he was not disappointed that the daughter was stillborn sadly he was disappointed that it was a girl so already the societal challenges as a reading really like Whew. okay drown me in the deep end why don't you i'm just trying to swim through the book but okay so that is how we meet our protagonist and it gets it gets good from then on so because we're given a lot of backstory about our protagonist um we need to get acquainted with her so of course um some backstory will be given remember she is one of four girls again at this point in the book you don't know if there's three girls or four girls you, you're warming up to the character but i'm sure it's four girls and um 
the father due to the gender disappointment i'm sure there were other reasons but due to the gender disappointment he um starts treating his wife's spouse with utter disdain i'm talking abusive in every way and form so he's not a present father after that he he taps out of the marriage we'll get into that later on so as a result um our protagonist recounts of how poor they are they live in a compound with nine other families now a compound is a common way of living in some Ghanaian communities it's sort of like this big yard sometimes not even a big yard but it's a yard full of flatlets and they're just all commune there um, she recounts one of the Christmases that they had where she literally thought that they would not have anything to eat. They actually had nothing to eat. But because the local church was giving away a free meal and some secondhand clothing, her and her siblings queued at the local church and for Christmas had um, the jollof rice, which she was convinced was going off and um, secondhand clothing so already again as a reader you bogged down you're like wow where to go man and just drag me with the emotional baggage of this character um and yeah that's how we 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 get to know who we are reading about fast forward to present day remember now we've been acquainted with our protagonist we know who she is we know she has siblings we know that she lives in very poor conditions in ghana in a compound with uh, sharing this compound with nine other families we know her living conditions are not the best of the best fast forward to present day it is even more highlighted um schools are about to open and they are behind on fees her dad again is nowhere to be found you know how i feel about these typical african themes with fathers that are absent anyway her dad is nowhere to be found and her mom has fallen into this deep state of depression she literally has cooped herself into the self-induced coma she just lies in bed all day can't do anything she's just helpless and so um the landlord reminds them that guys if you do not pay i'm tired of asking if you do not pay by 6 p.m tonight i'm going to evict you already it's it's just a lot emily is just stressed and so she is looking out okay how can i find money to pay the rent or to pay school like it's one of the which one do i pay and these are very common themes in some um african homes where children take on the responsibility of parents because the parents are either nowhere to be found or they just absent in some other form of way so a emily is highlighting that right at the beginning of the book the author makes it known very well that emily's dad is a deadbeat father he when he was around mistreated his wife abused her physically verbally you name it and now that he's not around it's just it's like a typical it pains me to even say this but it's like those typical african home themes i hate to say this because man we need to change that narrative anyway it's it's the fatherless home trope where the african kid has no father around it's just that theme of course it bothers me but it is what it is and as a reader you just you accept you're like um nothing new here folks moving on so <laughs> he's a drunk he's not around when he is around he mistreats people Ugh, it's like, you know it is what it is anyway the author proceeds to introduce us to emily's um friend and she is also a school high school dropout or school dropout i'm not sure if she even made it to high school emily dropped out of school of course she has to like take on the responsibilities of upkeeping a home remember her mom has um literally just fallen into this deep state of depression so she needs to keep at least her siblings alive if anything so she can't be going to school anymore and we meet her best friend who also did not is no longer going to school and her best friend is selling fruits at the market 
and get this her best friend is pregnant i know i'm also trying so hard not to judge because this is a reality for some people this is a reality teenage pregnancy is a reality for some so it, the author writing these things makes it very not difficult but challenging for one who is not in those shoes not to judge it's 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 good it's good that she brought it out like listen this is what's happening this is it this is the reality for most people read it that she, uh, she's shoving it in our throats and we just need to swallow you may be wondering how is emily making money um because the thought came to mind for her okay i need to either pay rent or school fees one of them so you may be wondering okay this girl has no education she's a school dropout how is she making money i was wondering the same thing thank you for asking so emily sews clothes or men's clothes with a sewing machine no she cannot afford a sewing machine with her bare hands and sometimes she also does laundry for um some people who can pay for uh, pay her to do their laundry with the washing machine what washing machine with her bare hands so i tell you some of the things you read here you look at your life you're like i am so thankful i just love how the author brings these things to light as you read along then we meet emily's boyfriend um at this point in the book he's just such a hero he's just this loving guy who um has been saving money for emily and the money he's been saving was to one day give it to her um to go and pursue her dream to become a professional seamstress because he has seen her passion for sewing for clothes and so when emily comes to him and tells him about the problem of the rent that look the landlord is going to evict us literally um tonight he decides to give her the money saying hey i was saving this up for you for your um uh, sewing school but because you're about to be evicted take this and pay the rent with it so we've literally met emily's circle we've met her sisters her mom her deadbeat dad um her best friend and now we've met her boyfriend now we have an all-round three-dimensional picture of who our protagonist is and now the story literally begins now one night when emily is cooking dinner um a black jeep pulls up and this woman affluent as ever steps out of the car and um, emily did not see her but her siblings saw her and they run quickly to tell emily hey yo <laughs> we just saw this woman looking stunning um from a, an amazing car like we never see these things in our neighborhood and she's here for mom Emily did not take them seriously at all. She thought, guys, I'm just trying to put something together for us to eat. Honestly, I don't have time for this. But a few seconds into the exchange, she realized, oh, they are quite serious. And so she runs to tell her mom, there is someone here for you. She's looking like this. She came out of this kind of car. <sighs> and her name is so-and-so. The minute Emily mentions the woman's name, the mom props herself up from the bed, from her literal state of almost death. I'm literally picturing Lazarus style. Props herself up and sort of readies herself as much as she could, you know, just to be presentable. And sits up on the bed and in enters this woman to speak to her. Now, the woman's name was Auntie Rosini and she comes in and sits and speaks to emily's mom they speak for a very long time upon her leaving she leaves um, a lot of money and this money managed to do so much it paid rent for the for the year and nine months it also paid for schooling and that night emily did not finish cooking whatever meal she was putting together they managed to have such an amazing meal so this auntie rosini actually offered them respite from their challenges as a reader now you're thinking okay we've been introduced to a new character who's playing a savior complex why was she there what does she discuss with emily's mom and what's her role in this bigger picture for emily so you want to know more about her as you read the book um <laughs> we learn the reason why emily um auntie rosini was speaking to emily's mom she had come to request for Emily to come and work for her as the help. 
I know my emotions too. So Emily's mom tells Emily this and she is not so thrilled. At first she's thinking, okay, can we first address how my boyfriend helped us out not to get evicted that one night? Where's that money? Can we address it? But all Emily's mom is speaking about is how this is a great opportunity for her as this will help with her siblings and um, how um, Auntie Rosini would be paying the money to Emily's mom which will help with the upkeep of the home and just the upliftment of her family in general. So Emily is, you know, she's she's not that thrilled, obviously. But at the same time, she's thinking, I want the best life for my siblings. Remember, she was looking to go to design school to become a seamstress, a professional seamstress. And now this has been thrown into her mix. It was an emotional conundrum. She was literally like, what do I do? Do I work as a help to give my family the best life or do I suffer away in poverty and cross fingers I someday make it to design school? What do I do? It was for a young girl. It was a lot. But here an opportunity was presented to her and now she had to think on her feet quick, quick. What do I do? What do I choose? What choice do I make? Do I even have a choice? Is it an actual choice? So yeah it's getting good that very night she goes and meets up with her boyfriend and she tells him everything and of course she's just pouring her heart out she's disheartened but the boyfriend gives great advice he's like look this is a great opportunity for you and your siblings for a better life just go ahead and work for her for a few years if anything you get out of there you've saved up some money you get to go to design school and all of this is happening while your siblings still have a very great life so emily decides in the end okay you know what i'll take it i'll still go to design school um it's just a few years delayed Pro actually it's probably quicker this route than the route of me crossing my fingers and hoping it'll fall from the sky this opportunity so i'll go to design school a few years later let me go work for her my family will be taken care of so she decides to go um, to work for Auntie Rosini. Her first day at Auntie Rosini's house, she is inundated with the opulence of that home. The big garden, the big home, the electrical appliances. I mean, this girl has been so poor for so long that she did not know some of these things existed. To her, it was all foreign and new and shiny and big. It felt like a whole new world it literally was a whole new world for her on her first day she meets um the young master <sighs> sorry i'm getting a bit hot here she meets the young master of the home and um they refer to him as the young master because he's the son of the home and he's able to request some services from the servants but he does this with respect and humor so they kind of like him um emily is then ushered in to go and meet auntie rosini the First thing she says when Emily um, meets her is, you cannot refer to me as Auntie Rosini. This is a professional setting. You call me Madame. I know, right? And so Madame, first of all, the book describes her as just lounging around, adorned in her African printed dress. Her hair falls easily on that dress. Emily assumes it's Brazilian because, you know, it's purchased hair. And she is reading the newspaper. Now, just take a pause. Who in today's world reads a physical newspaper? Hmm? Only the wealthy. We peasants <laughs> read our news online. So just accept that. Anyway, her first order of the day is to get the madame some water so she can take her medication. So Emily goes to the kitchen and is given um, a bottle of water on a tray. Do you understand the opulence? A bottle of water on a tr listen i'm telling you and she then brings it to the madame uh, so that she can take her medication emily is still taking it all in all these things in now what is what's going on here like what is this is this how have people been living like this how have i not known that this kind of life exists so for her it's She's just taking it all in. She's just taking it all so in. So Emily's first day at work was the very next day. And she was 
ordered to clean bathrooms. And the first bathroom she went to go and scrub and clean up was that of Zara, the daughter of the home. Now, Zara's bathroom was, first of all, bigger than the bathroom that she had shared back home with nine other people at the compound. It had so many beauty products that she never knew even existed. I, know, I mean, she's a girl. She knows beauty products exist, but there were so many that she was like, what? Oh, my goodness. Now, I have to look down at my notes because the author is so good at describing and writing some of the things in the book. The author said that Emily noticed that it had no worms or algae along its corners, nor did it have urine in places urine should not be. I remember pulling a face while reading this. That's when you know an author is really good at writing. When they are able to, um, I don't know, cause a reader to just squirm and pull faces and when your emotions are evoked just from words <clears throat> um, in a book that's when you know the author is, is is on the right track so i just love that it was quite it was nice and vivid i love that i digress um while emily was cleaning zara's bathroom um she walked she she heard zara come into the room and then emily left the room to go and get some bleach or some more cleaning um detergents and when she came back she noticed that zara was spraying the air freshener in the room and zara exclaimed so loudly that you stink now a moment of silence because we all know that african armpit smell can really get overwhelming we know that we know. <laughs> so I'm assuming our poor Emily was suffering from that African armpit smell. Okay? Listen, this is a girl who came from a place where she did not know where her next meal was coming from. So buying deodorant was the last thing on her mind. But it's okay. Rich kids are mean. It's okay. And like I said, perhaps Emily really, genuinely suffered from that African armpit smell. It, it, it can get a lot. It can get overwhelming. It's, it's like pungent, but it's okay. So Emily um, continues cleaning and finishes off, but Zara is just making these snide remarks and literally tells her brother Zaid again about how smelly Emily is. What Emily does, saves up some money and her first salary or first payment, um, she buys the exact same deodorant that Zara uh, was using because she saw it in her cleaning products and Zara never complained ever again <laughs> so emily um gets acquainted with her job and she warms up to the place where she's working in and starts making friends um at her workplace and one of the housemates or employees per se that she starts um making friends with her name is priscilla um priscilla they start taking a liking to each other and form some sort of friendship so priscilla had an errand to run to get one of her blouses altered and so e emily saw this as an opportunity thought to herself hey i know how to mend clothes i'm a self-taught seamstress i can help you out let me do it for you and so priscilla was extremely impressed with the workmanship of how emily altered her blouse and thought to herself oh my word like we should open up a business <laughs> um you do the sewing i find the clients at first emily was quite hesitant but she kind of thought wow this is extra money for me if anything so of course let's go ahead and do it and so that's uh, just another snippet that the author decided to throw in there just to remind us as readers that this girl really had a genuine talent for a self-taught talent if anything for um sewing mending and altering clothes like it was a, a passion of hers a um a skill that she could if she wanted to and of course she did nurture it and go as far as she could in life because of this is the one key thing that could um, bring her out of poverty as well as her family remember now her chores are primarily to scrub bathrooms because the other um employees or housemates employee housemates um have other stations to work around the house <clears throat> So one of the days while she, whilst she was cleaning the young master's house, Zaid, um, his room, not his house, um, she was dusting off for cleaning off his bookshelf and noticed a book on the bookshelf that she had read back in school. And in this book, she was just, you know, paging through it because back in her school, 
that same book had missing pages so she wanted to find out like what how did the story go and as she heard the young master enter the room she in haste dropped the book on the floor and afraid that she'd think the young master would assume she was snooping around she quickly apologizes and you know tries to explain herself like it's not what you think or i was just trying to uh, 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 you know it's one of those exchanges and the young master is like zaid by the way but the book keeps saying young master um he very very friendly says no nah, it's okay listen take it you'll give it back to me when you're done reading at this point i'm not sure how relevant all this information is in the book but you go along with it and then immediately after that exchange of you can read it and bring it back when you're done um they go into this hectic philosophical conversation about the existence of god now the reason why they went into this conversation is because zaid had recently lost um a very good friend of his tragically and he was just questioning the goodness of god like why did this happen to my friend and emily very much is a believer in god and um she, she her spiritual or religious background was very it was the core of her so she kept like strengthening him in some form as she's doing this um zaid is crying profusely like he's just bawling and she doesn't know what to do so she rushes off to her mom not her mom to zaid's mom rushes off to him uh to her wow she rushes off to zaid's mom to the madam okay to tell her listen your son needs you he is in a state um, the mom obviously rushes back to the room and soothes her son. Again, I'm not sure the relevance of this entire exchange in the bigger story, but I feel the reason the author put it in, there's some significance to it. So I did highlight it as I was going through my notes that maybe that intimate exchange did something for emily and the young master i'm not sure but also her calling the mom to step in because how else would the mom would have known that her son was in distress that also somehow i felt was something to hold on to to the back of my mind as i read along in the book life goes on fast forward you know she's still the helper around the house again with multiple other employees one day um zara has a birthday party the details of the birthday party are all in the book um but it's a typical teenage birthday party and some other adults are invited and um one of the family friends she's an attorney her um daughter is restless she has a little baby is very restless i'm sure from the loud music or whatnot and so the head house house help um ordered emily please take this um child and just take a little bit of a walk maybe just down the street you know she just needs to rest and emily does this happily uh, i mean remember she's the firstborn of so many other siblings so she she's got this down she knows how to soothe the baby and she does so she just takes a bit of a walk not too far from the main house and soon enough the baby indeed does sleep the mother then joins them um, a few minutes later and they sit under uh, some tree for some shade and the mother too exhausted uh, i'm sure the baby is um, very fussy so the mother too just sits under the tree has a bit of a short exchange with emily and she just dozes off right next to emily the party ends and then the husband looking for his wife and daughter spots them um, not so far from the home and approaches them as he approaches them emily notices something she has not seen ever in her life and that is the way this man is looking at his wife and his daughter i mean this man paused and took a picture because for him this was the most beautiful thing i'd seen his daughter sleeping and the wife resting and it was just this appreciation this man had for his little family the love the adoration and emily was like wow i want some of that like this exists remember the home she comes from her deadbeat dad and just the environment she was in none of this pure genuine love was evident so for her to see that made her yearn for it so much more and the possibility that it actually exists in normal people like her 
it was yeah it was something that she she yearned for again in the book you're thinking as you're reading okay okay emily is now exposed to so many other things outside of what she had known all her life something in her is changing something in her is just you know brewing so i'm 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 getting as a reader i was getting excited to see okay where are we going the author keeps throwing all these new things into emily's pot what are we cooking what are we you know let's see what comes out of this months later remember emily emily now is like thriving she's getting paid she's getting money she has a side hustle for mending and sewing clothes months later the um mill Moses. What did I just write here? The Moses. The Moles. The couple. Remember the couple that she so admired because the one at um Zara's birthday party. Yes, that couple. Okay? They um invite her over. Um not her specifically. They have some sort of situation and they invite her over um and ask her to babysit their daughter while they have a dinner or some sort of situation at their home and Emily does a fantastic job at this um, they then extend an invitation or, or a, um, a work opportunity to her saying Emily like our daughter absolutely adores you like you handle her like wow it's we need you we need you just twice a week She's not taking too well to our current um, helper slash babysitter. So please step in um, and help babysit. This is more money for Emily again. She is thriving. She, her, her, her life is improving bit by bit. So she steps up and says, of course, I'd love to do that. I mean, I'm taking a liking to your daughter anyway, and she too likes me. So I do not mind. Again, it's extra money. Now, did I mention that because of all these side hustles and her main job her life even at home her sisters her siblings are doing so well they are thriving at school just home life in general has improved you know um meals are better <laughs> they're not eating scraps just to make it through the night everything is just uplifted because of the one decision that emily made to go and work for the madame or auntie rosini and all of this ripple effect of her finding other side hustles has honestly just assisted um, the uh, upkeep of her family um, life back at home emily then um, has an opportunity to go back home after a few months and she then um when she gets home everyone is excited to see her everyone is so happy to see emily everyone except for her mother now her mom is very cold distant and aloof and emily does not understand why like supper at mom you i'm home you haven't seen me in months i have not been able to visit in months and you're the only one who's very strange um when she gets home again other circumstances are just Remember that childhood best friend who um, was pregnant when she, when Emily got her job, she had given birth and she's pregnant again. Now I'm just thinking, wow, the cycle of poverty just, you know, Emily managed to get out, get a job and a side hustle and a babysitting job. Like she's getting income. She has been exposed to so many new things out there. Um, she even has goals like she she knows what she wants in life like i want that i want a loving man like that should i have a family i want that contrast her best friend who is pregnant again yeah the the stark difference is whew, you can't help but judge and again you can't help but appreciate the author's ability to just slap you in the face with the realities of what um, poverty and choices can do i mean here's one person in the same environment has not escaped um, the situation they were born into and one managed to get out and you know the difference in all of that so yeah it was just reading that made me feel like oh yeah, I hate the realities of this. This is happening every day, every day. I don't know, there's a sense of um, 
when someone succeeds, those that don't around you, um, they feel a sense of extreme neglect. And this neglect um, turns into a bit of jealousy. And this jealousy can get really, really ugly. And that was the case with Emily's boyfriend. I know, I was rooting for him too. This is the one guy that literally gave her his savings so that she could pay um, rent and not get evicted. Here he was. Remember, she's back home. She's seeing all the people she hasn't seen in months and in almost a year. So when she meets the boyfriend, the dynamic is different. There's no lovey-dovey. He literally says, let's break up. I mean, he's just as cold. Let's break up. I'm sure it's a bit of insecurity that Emily's doing so well and he's not. She still says, no, dude, you're the one. I love you. I want to be with you. Like, why are you doing this? But it creeps in and the relation dynamic does become a bit off i'm as a reader thinking no girl go back to work and get paid get your money like who cares about these people but you must remember she's a human being the character she has emotions and all of this is coming at her so quickly she was so happy to go home to go share her um rewards or share her excuse me, her joys with those that um, she hasn't seen in a while. And almost everyone is just unwelcoming, you know? They're just meeting her with such disdain. She's just like, it's, a, it's, it's again, it's an emotional situation for Emily. The book quickly becomes dark, like so quickly. The progression, the progression of darkness just caught me off guard, like, whoa. We were celebrating a girl getting out of poverty, uplifting her life, working somewhere in some posh suburb, getting money to her family, her mom, her sisters. You know, fairy tale, for lack of a bet uh, better word. The book quickly, quickly becomes dark. One night, um, Emily does not go with her friends out um, as they go... I don't know what they're going to go do, but they just go out at night. She's like, no, I'll stay in because I'm expecting a call from my siblings at exactly 9 p.m. So she stays back at the compound, not the compound. I'm sorry. The compound is where her mom is. She stays back at the um, employee's um, quarters. There we go. And she then decides whilst hanging around waiting for her sisters to call, she's going to go and return the books that the young master had um, borrowed her. On her way to the main house, the young master's room, she spots the young master in his room with a man called the general. Now, the general is a family member, but the picture I get from him is just this creepy guy. Every family has one. Every single family has one creepy family. I mean, just like, ugh. Just when you see them at like family gatherings, Christmas, lunches, just your spine, just ugh. So the general was that kind of guy. <laughs> um they're in the same room him and the young master and emily just wants to return the books but they invite her in they're very friendly especially the young master remember we we like him right <laughs> wait a minute welcome her in the room offer her something to drink emily's not really one to drink young girls don't ever accept a drink from anyone anyway you can imagine what transpired after she was nice and drunk because they just kept offering her offering her offering her they were very friendly she I mean she was playing i think a game a tv game playstation xbox you know the environment was a friendly loose environment but they kept offering her drinks and she got extremely drunk and of course creepy general you can imagine what he did to her but the one that really got to me is the young master was in on it too. He too participated in this heinous act. <sighs> I know I was going through it for her, this protagonist. I was like, man, what? Why? Especially the young master. The general then proceeds to threaten Emily saying, if you tell anyone what happened here tonight, I will deny it. And yeah you're on your own like it's your word against ours basically it's just the turn of events yeah it's just 
mm -mm, it was not nice to read it was really not nice to read especially she had just come back from home her boyfriend just broke up with her her mom was cold and aloof she's just trying to get back to work and then this happens anyway emily after a while becomes mute like the trauma of that one evening hit her so hard she literally just becomes mute she can't speak her voice is non-existent and i think the same thing happened to maya angelo when she experienced a very traumatic event of the same kind when she was young she literally could not speak as a young child maya angelo was declared mute and dumb could not speak at all because that trauma closes up that type of trauma closes up your vocal cords it's just man just saying it it's like goosebumps i'm like yo imagine one event that can lead to just the constriction of your vocal cords it just that that what happened to emily took me straight back to maya angelo's um history anyway so emily now because she's mute she's lifeless it's traumatic she's she just does what she has to do she works where she has to work it's she's a zombie basically and when she goes to the Mill, millses um the attorney the the couple where she absolutely the couple she absolutely adores and loves and admires she's just as dead inside and the wife the mom of the little baby girl notices this and she thinks maybe it's the working conditions where emily is working and so she proposes hey emily i can help you out with your work contract if you're unhappy she has no idea what has transpired she's thinking it's the working conditions but then she leaves a card to emily because she sees emily's literally not talking like she's not talking this is unlike her she leaves a business card and on the business card it's again um emphasized that um mrs mills is an attorney Emily does not do much with this card. I think, in fact, in the book, she gets rid of it after a while because she can't, she, she cannot muster the courage to do something about this. Remember, this traumatic event has just rendered her lifeless. She's just going by it. She actually quits at the Millses and just keeps her one job. Even her housemates have noticed that something is off with Emily. So everything is just... It's just dark. It's just gray. The colors in the book have just... I don't know. They've ran out from this event onwards. We went from this colorful, dynamic Ghanaian background to this whew, concrete suburban home where something terrible has happened. And as a reader, you're also so discouraged. You're like, man, not to Emily. Not that the one person that things should not be happening to, not to her. Um, a few days later, or soon after, I don't know the exact timeline, but soon after, Emily goes and cleans the young master's room, Zaid's room. And in his room, she notices an envelope with um, a note inside. And as she opens up the note, there's some money. I know, I know. I'm also just like, really? you too young master you you that guy ill and the notes just says i'm sorry emily puts it all back together does not take the money and just continues to go by and just does what she has to do again she's just lifeless zombie mute creepy guy continues to be creepy like the general is just this creepy ugh, ew 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 um he continues his advances towards emily thinking you know he'll get lucky again and this time, Emily um, puts up a fight. The one time she puts up a little bit of fight in her, a little bit of fight in her, he beats her up to a pulp. And like she, she passes out. And when she comes to, the person who found her was Priscilla. I mean, Priscilla is one of her house help mates who she took a liking to. And they instinctively know what happened. They know, like, we know exactly why we die and who did this to you so she's beaten to a point where she's literally it's it's she's not looking good she needs a hospital asap and though and so they tell madame <sighs> people with money hey madame thinks that you think as a reader that madame would you know 
how about no 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 she does everything to silence the situation she offers emily all these things i will enroll you in your design school immediately don't say anything keep this to yourself remember she's also trying to protect her son because her son was in on it too madame also knows that of course the creepy general did this to you and the way madame is acting she knows that it's not the first time the general has ever done something so heinous so even with her reaction as a reader you're like oh Gandhi, this is normal this is very normal so you you you're disappointed but at the same time you're not surprised at the way she's reacting and i'm just feeling for emily like man this girl is that one thing after another just when you think she got a respite from the life she was living then this happens like why so oh my emotions are thrown everywhere at this point in the book i'm just extremely sad for her now <laughs> like i don't even know where to start because the book. <sighs> okay, so Emily goes back home. She is done. She's done in this place. Obviously, that's a normal response to the series of events. She goes back home and her mom takes care of her. This is the first time an inkling of motherhood was displayed by her mom throughout the entire book. You feel like, wow, she actually has a nurturing nature to her. The mom takes care of her daughter, um, you know, nurses her back to some sort of health. Emily's dad, you know, um, coincidentally shows up in the picture. But you know why he shows up? To accept some money from the general. <sighs> this dad, I'm like, ew, just, oh, such a dead beat he literally just came back heard about what happened came back for the compensatory money like his role in life what a loser oh my gosh anyway we jump back to the nurturing side of emily's mom because she vouches to um help her daughter get justice for what has happened to her and they all get emily and her mom all get into contact with mrs moses the attorney lady who she had babysat for and um, a trial begins and you think we're gonna go read this juicy trial this back and forth this he did this and this and this to me and you think a me too movement would you know erupt where other girls come out and say oh he did this to me too did this to me too because remember the general was no had a disgusting reputation of doing this to other house helps you think that no no you think that like i was waiting for juiciness like yo let's find out what went down in the trial if anything the book abruptly ends like it just ends you're like what just huh what just happened so no one's gonna give me what just happened the trial happened and emily won and the general went to jail that's great but can we get more details more information about the actual trial just a chapter all i'm asking for author is just one chapter about what went down at court but no the book ends just like that and I remember being so disappointed. <laughs> I remember being like, what? Like, was the author in a rush to end the book? Or you can't throw in such a monumental event, such a traumatic experience for a protagonist and not detail its unraveling. You literally told us what happened to her. She went back home. You don't tell us about the life that she'll be leading from then on. You know, it was very, I was not pleased with that ending. I was not at all. Yeah, author, I don't know. Hey? I don't know how I feel about that. This book safely gets two stars out of five for me. Okay, two and a half if I want to be generous. Because the ending was so flat and so strange. You only find out in the epilogue that emily applies to law school she doesn't even become the seamstress 
dream job of hers she applies to law school because of um the events from the trial because she wants other victims that have experienced what she experienced to get justice so it it felt rushed on my end but yeah it gets a safe two and a half stars out of five um thank you so much for watching this video and i'll see you in the next video